Right, we're on. So Ken's just joined us this evening, um, just staying up the road from us, and really appreciate him coming. So I'm going to ask him a few questions, we're going to have a little interview tonight, I'll ask you to ask him some questions as well, let's get to know him. It's great when somebody who is a Christian, you think we're like-minded, you know, he's been saved, we're saved, and we come and we meet together, we have fellowship, and, and he even has some of D sandwiches, and he really enjoyed those. Yes, so we can have food and thank you, Dean. It's lovely. Thank you so, so much. So, Ken, tell us a little bit about where you, where you are now, where do you live? Tell us a little bit about okay. your background, and then we'll get on to... <coughs> sure. Um, so, I live down near Dorchester, in Dorset. Uh, been down in Dorset since 96. Um, I attend Beer Regis Congregational Chapel, which is... It's very similar. It's very brethren-like. Uh, there's a little bit more joy, perhaps, than you would find in your average brethren church. You know, that people do, people do smile in our church, which is great. Um, the downside is it's not KJV only, which I do struggle with. Uh, but we have a when, well, I say we, uh, myself and some friends who I've known from year, for, from, for years now, uh, who go to various churches in the Dorset our Dorchester area, we meet together for Wednesday Fellowship, and that's KJV, which is great. So we do get that Where do fellowship. You meet? Where so we meet in a friend's house Lovely. in Dorchester, in the heart of Dorchester itself, yep. yeah, down by the train station there. And yeah, it's just a lovely time of uh, prayer and fellowship and Fantastic. reading God's word. Excellent. So, excellent. so now yep. tell us a little bit about yourself. You were born where, and tell us a little bit about your upbringing, sure. school, first job. <clears throat> sure. Okay. So I was born in Oxford. So Oxford's my hometown. Uh, left there when I was about nine, I think, with my parents who, my father had sold up his business and we moved down to the New Forest area, but not the good end. Near Esso Oil Refinery. A few miles from Bewley, not great. Uh, background, uh, from a Christian perspective, none. Yep. So my father was a militant atheist, yep. although they weren't described as such back in the 60s, but he was. He absolutely hated religion, Christianity, because he saw it as a weakness. And, and John and myself were chatting earlier, and I think my father, in many respects, very much like John's, yep. a man's man, yep. um, to have faith was just a sign of weakness. So I think he was really embarrassed when I became a Christian, but that was much later. My mother, a seriously lapsed Catholic, but with good reason, again, sharing with John earlier, that um, she would, my, so her mother, my grandmother, was a Catholic nun, had a dodgy ticker, so couldn't uh, continue in in the order, so she had to leave the uh, convent, (coughs) very naive young woman in her 20s, and she worked in a shoe shop in Oxford and was seduced by a Welsh shoe salesman from Abergavenny, hence my Welshness. Uh, so my mum was half Welsh. And so, yeah, so my um, my grandmother realised that she was pregnant. And of course, so you're talking about the shame. This is 1935. The shame of being an unmarried woman with child on top of that, the Catholic guilt thing and the shame. So my mum was actually born in a uh, home for naughty nuns staying in Eastbourne in, um, and then sent off to a Catholic children's home in Birmingham <clears throat> and then was rescued by her aunties and grew up in Oxford. So I do kind of get yeah. why she would be so anti. Um, so there was no, there was no upbringing whatsoever yeah. as regards we weren't encouraged to go to church not even to give them some spare time you know as, as lots of children were packed off to Sunday school weren't they didn't even have that so yeah so you went through the school system yeah okay. enjoyable enjoyable school not really no. to be honest no no um, not for any particular reason yeah, just, I'm, just not for me but. and what you, when you were younger what you know say in your um, teens like, what were you interested in were you sporty what sort of things were you interested in yeah pretty sporty I suppose running etc then yeah. um, uh, but really yeah it was music I love yeah. music yeah. Um, so played in a band a very young age so yeah I was saying to John earlier so I think one of the 
earliest influences on my life as regards faith was my RE teacher, Mr. Dion. And his RE lessons were fantastic because all he did was play Larry Norman LPs. Now, most of you won't, aren't old enough to know who Larry Norman was. He's now dead. He was, he was just, he was a rocker. He had long blonde hair. Paul Simon credits him as one of his biggest influences. So he was just a seriously cool guy. And I did sort of think, "Mm, maybe this Christianity thing isn't as boring and dusty as it seems. But then I discovered rock and roll and alcohol and girls. So yeah, it wasn't going to happen for me. And not at that stage. No, No, definitely not. So after after you left school, what sort of jobs did you do? Okay, so uh, left school and I wanted to go to college that was my well I really wanted to go to art school that's what I wanted to yeah creative so I came out with a load of O-levels uh, but my father being a very much a man's man and he he was a motorcycle mechanic that was what he did uh, then he laid out his own taxi business uh, but he was very practical and he he could not abide the thought of a son of his going on to further education he said you need a trade now, I don't know one end of a screwdriver or the other, so I said, yeah, but what can I do? And it was horrible, actually, as, as I've just previously mentioned, that I'm a vegan. I don't know if I did mention that. I think I did. I think I did, yeah, Jesus, vegan, so vegans everywhere. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so my dad got me a job in uh, Tesco it, as a Saturday boy in the butchery department. Would you? Would, I hated it. Anyway, so they offered me a job. Uh, I wasn't a vegan then. I wasn't even vegetarian then. But I was sort of just getting involved with animal rights and what have you, hunt stabbing and what have you. So, so I hated it. They offered me a full-time job and an apprenticeship. So I took it because I was 16. I thought, oh, I'm going to be earning some money. This is fantastic. Um, absolutely hated it. It was awful. A couple of years later, I managed to get out. Uh, in Southampton, it was a case... If you could get in the docks or you could join Royal Mail, you were made for life. I got into Royal Mail uh, and it, very good job, very good job and thoroughly enjoyed it. So I was, so yeah, work-wise, I then progressed through from posty and I was a training officer. So I used to train the new recruits. So that's what I did for many, many years as a young man. Yeah. So um, how, again, becoming a Christian, how to sort of that... How did you get to the Lord? How did the Lord find you? Did you find the Lord? Yeah, well, I got, I got married at a very young age. I was 20. My wife, ex-wife as she is now, was 18. And then, so we were both working. We had a mortgage. And then we had two children in our early 20s. Um, when we were in our early 20s. So, uh, yeah, so I got to the stage where I had a terrific job. We had plenty of money because my wife at the time was working as well. I had a good job in the post office. So, yeah, plenty of money, two children, nice house, living in a nice part of the world. Does life get any better than this? And that began to just niggle away, just niggle away. Is this, I'm 23, 24, I seem to have everything that the world can offer. And yet still, there was just something saying there's a piece missing here. I don't know, but it was just so gradual until one evening, my wife at the time, she was at work and I just felt compelled. The only Bible I had in the house, was funnily enough, it was KJV, it was KJV, it was New Testament and Psalms, Gideon's, that I was given when I was 11 years of age. And I just opened it, Matthew's Gospel, started to read, didn't understand a single word, these and vowels and what, what is this? But I just knew it was right. So I remember just falling to my knees and knowing that I needed to commit to the Lord. So, yeah, names to my wife, I want to become a Christian. So I think I was about 27. Yeah. How did that affect your life? Massively, because, um, yeah, I mean, it was the right thing to do. I got involved with a very charismatic church, about 12 miles or so away from where I was living, near Romsey. And, um, yeah, anyway, that was great, but then my life just fell apart because my wife went off with someone else and um, left the children with me, which was I was really thankful for. Uh, so, yeah, I managed to carry on working with the help of my mum and dad. 
But she did eventually come back. Uh, and then we were together for a couple of years, but that was it. It was dead, really. Um, and, yeah, so then I had to leave. So lived with my brother for a while, and, yeah, it was a pretty horrible time, really. How did you get your life back on track? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, what what is interesting is that I think sometimes God's call on our lives is just at the right time. Because when I knew... God was calling and I needed to answer that call, I seemingly had everything. And then, within a couple of years, so my wife left me, my dad died, and my brother died, age 34. So it was just everything, everything that was at the foundation in my life, you know, that shore rock, it was just gone. And I, I do believe that it was only through my faith it was a difficult time, I can't deny, but certainly having my faith seriously, seriously made a huge difference. Probably just carried me through that, more so than perhaps I realised at the time. But looking back, I don't know how I'd have managed without, without the Lord in yeah. my life. Brilliant. And you, you tried different churches, you've settled down in church, how have you grown spiritually through the years? Yeah, well I've moved about a bit. Um, I've always struggled with church, to be honest. Um, I know it's important. I know it's necessary. Um, and I am a bit of a maverick, so I do like to do my own thing. Um, so I've really struggled with church membership. So I've drifted from church to church. I love the church I'm going to now, Beer Regis Congregational Chapel. Good church, Bible-believing. believing. It's not KJV only as Alison's just pointed me into the, the direction of a KJV-only church in Paul. It's not far. No, no it's, it's a train journey away. So, but again, um, I've been there a while now, but I, I don't want to become a member because I want to be free to just... I just want that freedom. I don't want to be told what I can and can't do by... by the church, so by, because it doesn't adhere to the church's constitution. <clears throat> okay. um, aims and goals in life, what are they for you now? Uh, what do you want out of life? Well, uh, to just grow old disgracefully, really. <laughs> but, and also, no, to serve the Lord, actually, with the few years I've got left, because I'm very old now. <laughs> and, uh, no, I am seriously. Older than I look, yeah. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Um, but yeah, so yeah, just to serve the Lord more and more. And it's been really laid on my heart yeah. in recent, recent times, certainly the last few months, that I need to get out there and evangelise more. It's more passion. and more outreach. That's my passion because, you know, it's no good. We were talking about this at our little study group. Uh, we were saying, you know, it's no good. We're going to stand before the Lord and give an account of our stewardship. And what am I going to say? Yeah, well, I was quite active and knocked on doors and gave eight tracks in 1988. Okay, so what about the next 20, 30 odd years, you know? Uh, so yeah, it's been really laid on my heart and, and it's shared by our little group. And so, yeah, I'd like to just do, John asked me, you know, if I, what would I do if I could do anything? And it would be to be an itinerant street evangelist. Stroke, just outreach. I'd do it all, all the time and if Ken, I could afford to do so. Ken's just bought the gospel card, so he's one of the useful tool. Yeah, so he's coming. He's had a look at that one and the tool that today. I think that's a brilliant tool. So that's great. So we'll be shipping that to him next week. Fantastic. Um, questions? Anybody got a question? Uh, Ken. Matt. Yes, Matt. Uh, Ken, what has been the biggest answer to prayer that you've had since you were saved? Hmm, that's a very good question. Oh, yeah, it's a, that's a that's a good you can't question. Think of the biggest thing of Answered prayer. Um, I would say, although none of my immediate family are saved, I've known of close personal friends that have been saved, and that's the that's the greatest answer to prayer that we can possibly have. You know, I, I pray for the same people day and day, and for those that seemingly there's no hope for. So I was saying to John earlier, my son, 
a lovely lad, but he's a, he's a goth, stroke emo, he's in a death, or was in a death metal band, and buying into the dark side of things. Yeah, yeah, is that right? Yeah, you've got, you haven't got the earrings, you know, you take them out and your earlobes are down here. Yeah. So, yeah, answered prayer, answered prayer that I've seen friends who I've spent time with and who were so far away from the Lord come to the Lord. So, yeah, I'd say that's the biggest answer to prayer. Another question. Are your children saved? No. No, they're not. So my daughter's 35. Um, she's got a great job, very career-minded. She's um, assistant practitioner in the eye unit at Southampton General. Um, terrific job and a uh, lovely husband, mm. but she lives for the moment. Um, and I think her view is, certainly at this moment in time, that, you know, we're here once, we live, we die, and let's just live life to the full. So, but she's not antagonistic in any way. And my son, yeah... Like I said, I think, well, I think the fact that he recognises that there is a dark side, the opposite to that is that there must be light. Where there's darkness, there must be light. So I, I do hold out hope that one day he'll realise that and come to the Lord. So if, no. If they listen to this CD, is there anything you'd like to say to them? I would just like to say to them, talk to me, um, talk to friends, because I know... Adam, in one of his death metal bands, the guitarist was a Christian. Uh, so they are out there. And these people are usually, like I say, they're, they are open. So yeah, just, just talk and think things through. And I think it's, it's sad when I hear my daughter say things like that, that this is it. We're all going, we're all going to die anyway. So why not just live life? For the moment, day after day, getting it, sucking as much out of life as you possibly can. Because there is more. And yeah, I'd just like them to come to a place like I did back in my twenties, that they realise that there is more to life. There is a purpose to it. Because I was reading, I've been reading through Ecclesiastes and it's fascinating the phrase that's repeated again and again, under the sun, under the sun. There is no hope under the sun. It's only when we look above we have that, we have that eternal hope. So yeah, if you live life for the moment, then it's going to end. It's going to end pointlessly. What is the, um, the hardest part of your Christian life at the moment and what are you enjoying most about life at the moment? The hardest part of my Christian life, I think, is, um, Spending time, the vast majority of people I know aren't believers. And that's really, really hard to live with, as I'm sure we can all relate to. Not just family, but close friends. That's tough. Um, Trying to share the gospel. And I find that the, the one thing people really struggle with is they don't see themselves as sinners. They're nice people. They do nice things. And on the surface, they are, they're lovely. Most of my friends are really lovely people. They give to charity, you know, they don't eat animals, they do good things. But they can't recognise their need for a saviour. And that, that's, that's painful. Yeah. And what are you enjoying most about life at the moment? I just feel I'm in a good place. I enjoy my job, um, spend time with my family, still fit and active. Thank the Lord for that. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, my church friends, just life generally, I think, is pretty good, good. I've got a good balance, I think. Yeah, okay. yeah. A couple more questions. Anybody else? Uh, what has been your biggest life decision apart from the, becoming a Christian? Your biggest life decision. I suppose, although it ended sadly, getting married, because from that came my two children. So, yeah, I can't possibly regret that. I regret the way the marriage ended, but I don't regret because of what's come out of it. So, yeah. Is your wife a Christian or has been able to witness to her? No, she's remarried twice, my ex-wife. So we're no longer together, obviously. 
She knows, yeah. And I think, if I'm honest, I think that probably didn't help our relationship because we were so young when we married um, and we just grew apart because we were very, very different people until, you know, we, I think we got to a stage where we realised the only thing we had in common were the children, which was sad. So, no, I think she's been quite anti. Yeah. Maybe maybe because of the breakup of our marriage. She blames that. That's what was the reason. I haven't got a current wife. No, no, no. Who's looking? No, I'm not. Please. <laughs> don't, 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 don't pray for that. Honestly. Pro- <laughs> promise me you won't. No, I'm, I'm happily, deliriously, happily single. Yeah, yeah it's wonderful. Okay. Oh, I see a hand up. Oh. Right. Um, this, look, this looks formidable. Obviously, um, Kevin, you read the King James Bible, so could you tell us a bit about how you decided you wanted to uh, read the King James Bible? Why are you King James? Why am I King James? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, uh, again, having been a Christian since the late 1980s, I've read virtually every translation out there. Well, I I haven't because there are hundreds and hundreds of them, but I've read a lot of translations. And do you know what? I think, you know, the devil is the enemy of... He's our enemy, we know that, and um, he's the author of confusion. And I do I do wonder, you know, when, when I sit in church, when I have a time of study, and everyone's reading from a different translation. It might be something quite reverent, if you like, like the new American standard. It might be the message, really. You know, uh, but you just lose your way. And that brought me to, and I always loved the King James, because obviously it was through reading that New Testament and Psalms, which was a KJV. Um, I just love for it. I love English literature anyway, so to me, it's, I, I love Shakespeare, so the old English has never been a barrier for me. I know, and I do appreciate that people find it difficult. I do. But it, it actually isn't. When you, when you get into it and the beauty of the language so engages you, well, this is what I've found, that you just want to read more and more and more. Whereas if you read the NIV that reads like a magazine, it's so boring. It's not, you know, can't really say. it's not boring because it's the Bible, but it's a perversion, isn't it? It's a perversion. And it just doesn't sit right with me. So it's been a gradual, it hasn't been an immediate, I'm KJV only. And I think it's probably good that I've not been, because I've been able to spend time, not analysing exactly, but certainly comparing. And I don't think anything holds up to the KJV. And if it did... And a year's time, there'd be another one. And I think, oh, this is perhaps just slightly better than the ESV. <coughs> and so it just goes on and on and on and on. Lastly, if there was three things you could change about the church, what would it be? K- oh, obviously, the King James. Yeah. King James, yeah. yeah obviously, if they were... Yeah. King James only. Um, I think we're well on the way there, um, as regards... As, as I wish... Where they are with the youngsters, we've got... We are blessed with quite a young congregation, really, for an old-style church. Um... And they're quite actively involved in outreach training. They go off to a camp and what have you. But yeah, to be more outreach minded. Yep. But we are, we've just employed a youth evangelist. Okay. So we haven't got a pastor at the moment. Died a couple of years ago. So uh, we have guest preachers who are brilliant actually, I will say. So the, in the, in the, the, the um, at the flat adjoining, uh, this, this young chap and his wife are going to be moving in. So that's really positive. So we are almost there. We're, we're well on the way to being more evangelistically minded. Any other thing? Uh, what else would I like to see? Have? Just, I would like to see, as, as you would, I'm sure, just more, more and more people getting in on board, especially the local people who, you know, they, they've... Again, it's that nominal faith thing, isn't it? They go to the local C of E, but they're not getting true teaching. Other than the KJV thing, I think there is sound doctrinal, doctrinally sound teaching at our church. So, yeah. Last question, anybody? No, no I think I'll... If you, um, if you, last question then. If yeah. you could um, give us, youngsters here, 
any advice from your your path of life so far? Yeah. Uh, what, would, what would that be? Because you've obviously seen the children grind, you've seen what they've got into. But for youngsters, what, what advice would you give? Okay, so I think for certainly youngsters that aren't married, I'd say go very, very careful. You know, I've, I've learnt that from what I got into, the marriage situation I got into. So I, I would advise anybody, you know, don't be unequally, yeah, do, and don't be unequally lo- yoked. You know, don't get together with a Christian, uh, with a non-Christian boy or girl and think you're going to convert them because it just might not happen. And that's that's going to lead to years and years of poss- you know, real, real difficulties and... Um, possible disaster so I think yeah you've got to choose for, for young young people you've got to choose a Christian partner got to yeah that's true well it's great to have you Ken thank you really thank you John it. thank you uh, no you're welcome you're more than welcome thank you uh, we'll keep praying for each other